what you really have is what I describe as the rise of the rest in my book. In every part of the world, countries are finding that they are able to take advantage of political stability, economic convergence, technological connectivity, and substantially improve the lives of their citizens. We need to acquire skill sets rather than thinking about being cogs in a large machine. What is the best way for regular Americans to take advantage of these shifts? Education, education, education. And it's not an education that stops with a college degree. It's learning new skills, training yourself. I think we will have to come up with a new American dream, very much the kind you were talking about. Dynamic, mobile, flexible, entrepreneurial. Uh, you'll fall down a lot more often than you used to fall down in the old American dream. The key is having the skills to pick yourself up again. Governor Bush and I welcome you to day two of our conference on the globalization of higher education. And after yesterday, we understand more about what it's about and what the potential is. Fareed Zakaria is the host of CNN flagship's international affairs program, Fareed Zakaria GPS. He's editor-at-large of Time Magazine, a Washington Post columnist, and a New York Times best-selling author. And we all watch him, and I think we all admire him. He's been described as the most influential foreign policy advisor of his generation. And in 2010, Foreign Policy Magazine named him as one of the top 100 global thinkers. I think I'd make it the top 10. Dr. Sicaria's in-depth interviews, and they are in-depth, with the Dalai Lama, heads of state including Barack Obama, King Abdullah II, and Muammar Gaddafi, as well as countless intellectuals, business leaders, politicians, and journalists, have been broadcast in more than 200 million homes around the world. While his cover stories and columns on subjects from globalization and emerging markets to the Middle East and America's role in the world reach more than 25 million readers each week. Dr. Zakaria's most recent book, The Post-American World, has been heralded in the New York Times book review as relentlessly intelligent. And The Economist called it a powerful guide to forming global challenges. I think probably the best thing I can say about this man is what I used to say about David Broder at the Washington Post. When I read his column or hear him and watch him on television, as I do every time I can, and when I find out that his position is different from what mine was, I go back and re-examine my position. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have here today Dr. Fareed Zakaria. <laughs> did you know David Broder? No, I did very well. <laughs> Thank you so much, Governor. Thank you, Governor Bush. Uh, it is a great, great treat and thrill to be here. Uh, of course, I am somewhat intimidated uh, by the prospect of addressing an audience as distinguished uh, as this one, uh, but I will, try to, I will try to do my best. Uh, I think of myself, in a sense, as the guinea pig uh, for the experiments and the, the issues you're talking about, because you're talking about American education, higher education, its power, its reach, uh, what it means to the world. And I was this kid in India who was, in a sense, watching the world you were describing. Uh, and so what I thought I'd do is tell you a little bit about what that world looked like from my perspective. I was growing up in the 1960s and 70s in India, and I was you know, fairly interested in the world and, and uh, enjoyed uh, reading and understanding what was going on. And I knew from a very early age that I wanted to go to the United States for my higher education. I'm not sure exactly when, and honestly, I'm not sure exactly why, but I just knew that the future 
seem to beckon in the United States. And so now I try to think back on what, what it was that made me think that way. Well, in the 1960s, the best kids in my school in Bombay used to go to Oxford and Cambridge. But by the 1970s, when the winter of discontent hit Britain and economic stagnation, you remember this is a time when Britain was put under an IMF program uh, because its economy was in such bad shape. The money dried up. And at the very same time, American universities started providing uh, scholarship money for foreign students. And so I think that at the, in the background of what I was experiencing was this realization that there was a possibility to go to the, uh, the United States uh, and the possibilities from Britain were being foreclosed. So in a sense, it's a reminder that culture does follow power to a certain extent. Uh, the, the, the fact that the United States was becoming more and more generous was certainly part of the, uh, the attraction. But more than anything else, I think it was, you know, I know it's going to sound corny, but it was the American dream. It was the American idea. It was the prospect of being able to think broadly and freely and independently. I remember vividly thinking about what it would be like to go to Oxford, uh, and read one subject uh, and go to an American university and be able to take physics and poetry and engineering and history and thinking about how much more liberating that second prospect seemed. And so I'm going through these thoughts and I talked to a friend of mine who was American and I remember well, he was a Princeton graduate and he says to me, you want to go to the United States? This is in the late 1970s. And I said, yeah. He said, well, why? It's hell over there. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, we're going through the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And he explained to me what stagflation meant and what the misery index was, uh, unemployment plus inflation, which was in those days over 20%. Uh, percent. He explained to me that the United States had just been through the most humiliating pe period in its foreign policy, a withdrawal from Vietnam, the collapse of South Vietnam. Uh, and he explained to me how deeply distrustful Americans were of politics. You know, you think that Americans don't like politicians these days. Remember back to the 1970s after Watergate, the depth of the suspicion of Americans had about, about the political class. Uh, and he said, you know, and, and then I started reading more about and realized the Soviet Union was on the march everywhere from Angola to Southeast Asia to Central America. The United States was seen to be in decline, if not in geopolitical decline, certainly in geoeconomic decline. Japan was, uh, was, had been growing at that point at 9% a year for almost 20, uh, 24 years, I think. Now, the funny thing is, of course, uh, Americans never realize, well, things might look bad for them at home, you know, they don't have a real global perspective. They were pretty miserable in India at the time as well. Um, you know, India was going through an emergency, which was essentially martial law. It had the slowest growth that it had really in its, in its history. Uh, and so I was still interested in going to America. And I, I applied. I got to the United States pretty much in the middle of the worst recession since the Great Depression, the recession of the early 1980s. But what was striking to me about going to the United States even in this very difficult time, which in, you know, at the time was regarded as a period of deep, deep crisis in every sense, was that Americans remained extraordinarily optimistic about the future. Am Americans remained uh, engaged and sure that in some way, whatever problems there were, they were going to find solutions to them, not necessarily the political class, not necessarily Washington, not necessarily through politics, but somehow individuals had this sense of ownership of their lives, which was very different from what I had experienced growing up in India. And of course, a year and a half after I got there, the United States was booming. The, uh, the economy had turned around. Ronald Reagan was able to campaign in 1984 on the theme, it's morning in America again. Uh, and far from the Soviet Union being triumphant, by 1986, 87, the question really was, is the Soviet Union on the verge of collapse? And the answer was yes. Uh, and so, so it was. And of course, at the time, we didn't see it that way. At the time, you remember the stock market crash of 1987 induced a huge panic of fear about the United States. Uh, I remember at the time, John Kenneth Galbraith, probably the most famous economist 
in the world at the time, wrote a long piece the day after that black, uh, the, that black stock market uh, crash, saying we have just gone through our version of the Great Depression, uh, of, the, of the crash of 1929. Let's hope we don't go through our version of the Great Depression. In fact, two weeks later, everything was back to normal. I remember in the real recession of 1991, uh, when there was such deep anxiety, economic anxiety. It's important to remember just how anxious Americans were at the time. To give you a sense, and, and uh, I think Governor Bush will appreciate this, George H.W. Bush, senior, was a sitting president who presided over victory in the, in the Cold War, then presided over victory in the Gulf War, you know, the war with Iraq that actually went well. One year later, he was defeated from re-election by a, a governor from a small state, an obscure small state, who had a history of marital problems. Now, how likely is that? The, the only two governors from very small states in American history, Franklin Pierce and Bill Clinton. And it tells you the depth of economic anxiety people had in 1991-92. So, there was so much anxiety, of course, that it produced a third-party candidate, uh, another rarity in American history. And that third-party candidate, um, you, you know, the odd thing about America is when you find a third party candidate who is speaking to the needs and, and anxieties of the average Joe, that guy tends to be a billionaire. I don't know why, <laughs> but it almost always happens. Uh, and so it was with Ross Perot. But with all that, and I, so those of you who can remember the strange antics of that campaign where he actually withdrew and then went back in because, uh, you know, uh, without getting into the details, a very strange candidacy, and still, Ross Perot got the largest percentage uh, of a third-party vote of anyone since 1912, since Woodrow Wilson, William Howard Taft, and Theodore Roosevelt ran against each other. Such was the depth of economic anxiety. And of course, two years later, what economists were trying to figure out is how can the economy produce so many jobs and reduce unemployment so much without triggering inflation? This was actually a very interesting academic problem, which was for four or five years, the economy was producing so many jobs that economists had believed it was impossible to do that without triggering inflation. And of course, you have the Asian crisis in the midst of all this, when people thought the whole world was blowing up. Um, you remember Robert Rubin goes out and talks about the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. You had the Russian default, long-term capital imploding, Again, it's seen as a huge systemic crisis. You had the stock market crash. So I'm going 95, 96, 98 is the Russian default, 2000 is the stock market crash, the NASDAQ crashes, $3 trillion wiped off American stock exchanges, and then you get to our crash. But what's happening in this whole period? In this whole period, what is actually happening is the end of the Cold War, the convergence of countries to an economic model, largely one that was that was uh, established and promoted by the United States. The end of any real alternative to a, a kind of an American-led order uh, in the world, globalization, and an information revolution, all of which left the United States really at the on the top of the world. And why was this happening? Well, I would argue this was happening because of more than any other thing, the, the diffusion and spread of the American idea. And the American idea is one that I think is largely encompassed by what the, the very simple idea I was trying to present to you at the beginning, which was, in America, people can really think for themselves, be themselves, act for themselves, and take control of their own destiny. And all these things go together, but at the heart of it, is thinking for yourself. And that is what I think makes the American higher educational system unique, because it infuses America with this, this belief, this skill, and this knowledge that you can think for yourself. I remember many years later, this is maybe 10 years ago, I was in Singapore, and I was meeting with the Minister of Education of Singapore at the time. And as you can imagine, the Minister of Education in Singapore is a pretty serious job and a pretty smart guy. The guy is now currently the Deputy Prime Minister. Singapore, as you know, on the PISA tests, 
does spectacularly. At the time, actually, it was the number one rated country. It, there are four tests, right? There's fourth grade math and English and eighth grade math and English. So there are four possible boxes. Singapore was, at that time, when I was meeting with him, was number one in all four boxes. And I said to him, clearly, you guys do an extraordinary job uh, at these tests. Tell me something, though. When you look 20 years later, where are the great Singaporean inventors, entrepreneurs, composers? Um, I don't see so many of them. And the Americans who do terribly at these tests seem to do all right in that, in that, you know, in that uh, test 20 years out. Why is that? And he had a very, very thoughtful response. He said, you're absolutely right. Here's the way we think about it. We have an educational system that does one thing very well. We teach people to take tests, and they take tests very well. You have an educational system that does another thing very well. You teach people how to think. And it may be that that latter uh, 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 task is more important to success in the, in the world going forward. And I think that really encompasses, in, encapsulates what makes the, the American system different. I grew up in a nation system. I went through all those tests. Uh, and you know, there, is, there are certain virtues to them. And I believe me, I think that there are virtues in the, in the hard subjects and in the soft subjects. I, I had to memorize enormous amounts of poetry growing up. And I still think that one of the things that is lost in modern education is that the sense of the rhythm and cadence of language that comes from just memorizing large quantities of it. I believe very strongly that a certain very uh, basic understanding of mathematics is, is helped enormously by things like rote memorization of multiplication tables. And you know, being an Asian parent, I've tried to make my kids do some of those things, uh, which is fighting, again, you know, fighting a very uh, different system. But I would never make the trade because the truth of the matter is that the most important thing you can teach children is how to think. And the American system does that so much better than any other system, as far as I can tell. Uh, and the most important thing you need to try to figure out how to do in life is to ask yourself how to think. And so I look at the American system, and I say to myself, it is not an accident that those trends I described have taken place the way they have. It is not an accident that the American idea has tri triumphed in so many ways around the world. And you can see its success in the way in which the American curriculum is being replicated in so many countries around the world. Uh, you know, when you look at new universities uh, or universities being revamped, what you notice is that they are taking on many of the attributes of this kind of questioning. And by the way, the American system, of course, in some ways encapsulates many of the best traditions uh, of Western Europe as well. And so I asked myself, well, why did the American system work so well? Why is the American system of higher education work so well? Well, it seems to me that it, it encompassed three or four uh, trends which historically have been disaggregated and separate. The first is that you had vigorous competition between the public sector and the private sector. There are private universities in the United States, there are public universities in the United States, and they compete. They compete for students, they compete for faculty, they compete for publications, they compete in the realm of ideas. And of course, they compete in sports as well. And that level of that kind of competition has produced, as it has throughout history, a, a search for excellence, a striving for excellence. The second piece is, that the government does not administer a great deal. So if you contrast it to universities in Europe, which are very distinguished in their own ways, uh, what is striking about many of them is that they are administered largely as state bureaucracies, with a bureaucrat in charge uh, as president. And it is difficult, and there are two models. One is you have a bureaucrat, or you have a member of the faculty who is, uh, who is on a rotating basis uh, president for two or three years. Uh, as a university president friend of mine once said, now you have the inmates in charge of the asylum, it is never going to work. Um, but but the, the truth of the matter is that in, in any event, you do not have a highly responsive, professionalized administrative uh, system. And the third has been massive federal funding for, for uh, particularly research. Funding but not administration. And you put all those things together, and you have an 
a really a, unusual model. And this is the modern American model of higher education. It has some, uh, you know, it, has, it owes something to the, the 17th and 18th century, but it really was developed and invented largely in the 20th century, largely in the, in the, in the middle of the 20th century. And that model has proved strikingly successful. And so when I look around the world and ask myself, you know, where, where are the, the, uh, the opportunities, where are the places one should, one should uh, be concerned about? In many of the cases, you still have essentially state bureaucracies running these university system. And I think that while you can achieve something, and you can see this extraordinarily powerfully in China, in terms of achieving scale and achieving a certain kind of rollout, it is difficult to imagine that you will get the continuous innovation that you are able to get with the model I just described. But I know that you're all here because you see this model in crisis, and it is in crisis. I think it's in crisis, by the way, for reasons of success. You have a high quality problem. The, the two great forces that have been propelling the world in the direction I was describing are globalization and technological change. And both of them have powerfully benefited American institutions so far. They have benefited American companies. They have benefited the United States and the world. But they have also benefited American universities. You, this is one of the great effects of globalization, which is the local opera singer perhaps loses some of his appeal because now everyone can listen to Pavarotti. Right? And that same phenomenon has been at work with the United States, but not just for the Harvard, Yales, and Princeton's. It has, it, is, it has disseminated widely as well. But now you face a new reality where these new forces are beginning to have a leveling effect in various senses of the word. You, know, you can see this, this uh, process take place in the, in the realm of business as well. For the first wave of globalization, American businesses were surfing this world of globalization and technology and were able to master it in ways that seemed unimaginable for any other, any other uh, businesses, certainly coming out of Asia or Europe. But now what you are seeing is globalization 2.0 is allowing, is allowing these other countries and other in the companies an opportunity to challenge the American companies, companies from around the world, because they too can take advantage of the reality of a global market, the reality of cheap technology and cheap communications. And as a result, they are moving fast and furiously. And that same reality, I think, applies in the realm of education. And it particularly applies in the realm of education because you are beginning to see a technological transformation uh, that is really quite breathtaking. Uh, and it, I'm now borrowing entirely from a wonderful book called The Second Machine Age that I really heartily recommend that all of you read by two MIT economists. And what it explains to us is why it seems as though technology is moving at warp speed in a way that it didn't in the past, and why that seems so challenging to human beings. And he, the simple answer to that is, the first machine age, machines improved incrementally, ar arithmetically. But in the second machine age, which is the one we're in now, where everything is computerized, computers improve geometrically. And so he tells the story in this book, they tell the story of, of the invention of chess as a way to remind you of the power of exponential growth and to think about how computers are now increasing in power in exponential terms. And it's just a wonderful story to remember because it remind, it, 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 it's a vivid illustration of what it means for computers to be doubling every 18 months the way Moore's law tells you it does. So chess was supposedly invented in India. I, you know, this is one of those facts that's too good to check because as an Indian American, I've, I'm, I'm going with it. I don't know if it's actually true. The guy who invents chess goes to the king and says, come up with this great ga board game. It's fascinating, it's strategic, it, the king loves it. He says, this is the greatest game I've ever seen. Ask for your reward. And the guy thinks and he says, you know, just give me a grain of rice on the first square of this board and then just double it as we go. And the king says, that's all you want? Sure, of course you can have that. 
And he tells his treasurer, go work out the details with this guy. And now you can imagine what's going to happen. So they, they go, you know, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. And by the time you get to the 32nd square, you are at 4 billion grains of rice. But the treasurer says, you know, that's still grains of rice. I think we can manage. We in, in the treasury, we have enough to make this work. But of course, you're at the 32nd square. That's the top half of the chessboard. Now you get down to the 33rd square, and you're starting at 4 billion. By the time you get to 2 to the power of 64, the 64th square on the chessboard, you are at 18 quintillion grains of rice, which is 18 million billion grains of rice, which is a pile of rice larger than Mount Everest and larger than the total production of rice in the world today times 1,000. <laughs> when the king realizes this, he kills the inventor of chess. <laughs> But the point of this story, of course, is to remind us we are now living in the second half of the chessboard. That is, unlike a machine, you know, a furnace that can improve its productivity, its capacity, only incrementally, computers are able to do it at this astonishing exponential rate. And that is why computers are now able to do things that they have never been, nobody ever thought they would be able to do, like play chess. You know, the, the, the great, great line of the, uh, the, the chess grandmaster when asked, what would he do if he, what would he bring to the game if he was up against IBM's Deep Blue? He said, a hammer. <laughs> you know, it actually turns out to be even more complicated to get a computer to play Jeopardy than to play chess because there are so many nuances and different, you know, in, 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 it, it's difficult to understand, for example, when, it, when the question is, some, is about a superstar. Are you referring to Britney Spears or are you referring to, a super, uh, you know, to a something in the, in the, in the sky? And, and those differences a computer is now able to master seamlessly. IBM's Watson, as you know, has beaten the world Jeopardy champion. Computers are ab able to now drive cars in ways that are astonishing. And the early results from these driverless cars are you know, extraordinary, as you can imagine. The, the, you know, the computer driving the car never gets lost, never gets drunk, never gets tired. Uh, and as a result, you are looking at a future of potentially driverless travel. Uh, airlines, by the way, are finding that in, in, in the last f uh, uh, five or seven years, the, the number of times they have had trouble, not just crashes, but difficulties, has been related to pilot error. And why has there been pilot error? Because computers now fly the plane for such a large period of time, 98% of the flight is li you're literally on an auto autopilot, that the pilots are forgetting how to fly. And that the FAA is now beginning to mandate that pilots actually get back into the business of flying and take the controls from the computers. I bring this all up because education is facing precisely this new wave of technology. And this new wave of technology appears obviously in the realm of MOOCs, and it appears in uh, hundreds of other forms. And yet, I find that the education establishment is very resistant to embracing and understanding this change. Uh, and I think this is short-sighted. I remember presiding over a panel about three or four years ago, three years ago, that uh, Time Magazine put together on MOOCs. And the the, the, there was one person presenting, Andrew Ng, the founder of Coursera, and there were four, or was it five, university presidents on the panel. And if I can be honest, I have never seen a, a more defensive reaction among a group of intelligent people. Their response to everything Andrew Ng said was, yes, but. And that has generally been the response of traditional universities to MOOCs, yes, but. We do something different, we do something special. And I'm not here to tell you that MOOCs are gonna transform uh, education in general, but I will tell you this technology has to transform education. And I tell you this because I, I remember thinking about this vividly, because I, I am in an industry that has been utterly transformed by information technology in a way that would have been unrecognizable even 10 years ago. You know, if you look at uh, the extraordinary profitability of magazines like Time and Newsweek only 20 years ago, 
And then think about the fact that the day that panel was taking place, by the way, in New York three years ago, was the day that Newsweek magazine announced it would no longer publish. I said, that to me is a, is a, is a powerful reminder that you can, you can sometimes think these trends are not going to affect you. You can think that you're doing something special, and then suddenly they do. And the great uh, uh, challenge or opportunity here is that these are, these are technologies that could be powerfully beneficial to universities. Um, I think you are beginning to achieve something that is almost unheard of in education, which is it's always believed that scale worked against customization. If you think about education, it hasn't been transformed really since the time of you know, Socrates and Plato. Guy stands in front of the, the classroom, tells a bunch of students what he thinks about, about life, the world, the meaning of life. Those people imbibe it in some way or the other. The big difference is now you have women in, in both places as well. But other than that, that's really what education has done. And we have always believed that the larger the number of students, the poorer the quality of education. So scale has always worked against customization, which is why in the 18th century, even in much of the 19th century, the richest people always had private tutors rather than uh, sending their kids to school. What MOOCs are beginning to achieve is to actually make these two things positively correlated, not inversely correlated. So that when you listen to what people who are at Coursera and edX are able to do, it's really quite astonishing. You realize that when you have 100,000 students taking a course, you also are developing data. And that data tells you that when some kid in the first quiz is getting the third question wrong, we now know, because of the data, that probably he needs to take a quick remedial Five, watch a quick remedial five-minute video that explains one key concept. And if he's getting the fourth question wrong, he needs to watch another video or do another set of interactive lessons. Now think about that. If you're teaching a class with 500 kids, a big lecture hall, you have no idea who is absorbing what material. And it is very difficult for you to customize at any level. But when you have 50,000 kids, you are able to customize to each person who is going astray at one moment and can be corrected. That ability to bring together scale and customization is really extraordinary. And that strikes me as the opportunity that, that, that all of you have. The second one, of course, is one that you are already exploiting, and it is globalization. It is this extraordinary uh, ability for American universities to speak to the world. This is, I've said it many times, but there's no question that if you were to ask yourself, what industry is the United States truly dominant in, in a way that really there is no competition, it would be higher education. You know, 18 of the top 20 universities in the world are, are, are American. About 30 of the top 50 are American. And these numbers come from a Shanghai ranking, so they're, they are, they're probably fairly quantitative. I think that the more important thing to think about here is that the United States has this extraordinary opportunity to lead and to show how to create these new interactive models of learning and to show how to create a new global model of learning. One of the things I'm most proud of from the time I was uh, a member of the Yale Corporation is that Yale has tried to, uh, is set up a liberal arts college in Singapore where what we are trying to do is to create a new model of, of a core curriculum that is truly global so that people will, will read Aristotle as they would at Columbia or Chicago or Yale, but they will simultaneously read Confucius, who was Aristotle's exact contemporary. And they will ask themselves, why were Aristotle's concerns thus and Confucius' concerns so different? When they study Charles V, the Habsburg emperor, they will also study Akbar, the great of India, and ask, why did one guy run his, uh, his empire in this way, and why did another guy run it another way? And by the way, what you will notice is Charles V was an extraordinarily intolerant, religiously intolerant emperor, and Akbar was an extremely religiously tolerant empire. And Brandon will remind you that these trends have worked various ways in, in history. Those are the kinds of things that I think we have this extraordinary opportunity to provide uh, people with a sense of. Now, I don't want to in any way minimize the challenges you face. And I do think that 
some of these challenges are very traditional challenges, and I, don't minim I really don't minimize them. When I look at what made the, you know, the American dream, uh, what made uh, country, you know, places flourish, I, I always think of California, because when I was growing up, the thing you always looked at to figure out what, was, what the future was, was California. You know, you always knew that whatever wacky trend was taking place in California at the time, like vegetarianism or gay rights, was going to in some way infuse the rest of society and the rest of the world. Uh, and and ca California, in that sense, was always inventing the future. And Silicon Valley, of course, is the ultimate expression of that. But why did that happen? It happened because California was away from the old structures of power. It was geographically separated. It had beautiful weather. It had wonderful landscapes. But it also happened because in the 1950s, you had va vast numbers of, of engineers who went to California. And why did they go there? They went there because California had the greatest public education system in the world. You could go from kindergarten through University of Berkeley PhD programs, and you could legitimately believe you were getting the finest education at every stage that, that money could buy, except that it was free. That reality, combined with extraordinary public uh, investments in parks and highways, is part of what attracted all those engineers there. And let's not forget, of course, vast government contracts. The reason you had all those engineers in California was because of Lockheed and Grumman and all the Defense Department business. 50% of all silicon chips in the United States in the 1950s were bought by the Department of Defense. Um, and that was what drove the cost curve down to the point where it became commercially viable. So the reality here was that the Californian dream was based on a number of, of different factors. Great universities, great, great opportunities, but at the heart of it lay an enormous amount of public investment. When we look at American universities and compare them to European universities, we're very proud of the extraordinary structures and I talked about them, but don't forget, we spend a full percent of GDP more than Europe does on higher education. And so you cannot do this for free. And I do urge all of you, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, to petition, to organize, and to articulate the importance of public education. Because it seems to me, I, you know, this is one of the great tragedies that is befalling the United States right now. I remember when, when watching it, uh, from the Yale Corporation over the last few years, when every time we, we had a science position in particular, we were able to, I, I'm sorry to say, identify state universities where uh, incredibly talented scientists were frustrated uh, and were more likely than not amenable to leaving. Almost in none of those cases, by the way, were they asking for more money themselves. They just wanted good labs. They wanted the ability to attract graduate students. They wanted the ability to work in a receptive environment where they didn't worry year to year that their lab funding would be cut off. That reality is so powerful, and I think it is so important that we preserve and enhance that commitment to public education, uh, because it really is at the heart of American access, the, the, the mobility that the United States has provided people with. I mean, state universities are really the gateways for the American dream. And to the extent that they are now being forced to turn themselves into private universities, to create you know, a, a track for people who are who are paying, and then treat those people like customers rather than students. These are all trends that look inevitable, but frankly, with a, with a, with a different commitment of public resources would be, would be ones that could be tempered extraordinarily. I feel as though you have ex huge challenges on both these dimensions, um, but I think that they are huge opportunities if properly seen. The United States is at the forefront of both the trends I've described, technology and globalization. And if you don't fight the trends and instead embrace them and ask yourselves, one way to think about this mind experiment, and I know there are other universities here from the rest of the world, and I think you appreciate this perhaps more than many of the American universities would. Imagine that you're in the, in the, uh, in the other position. Imagine that you are a foreign university, not American, and think about how much easier it is to be in the position of being an American university in this, uh, in this ecosystem with the brand name you have, with the, the brand that comes with being an American university, with the access and ease of technology that everyone has, and with this global perch. 
and try to take advantage of all those, all those realities. I think that if we do it right, you will be able to see this process as one of a force multiplier rather than a set of challenges. And it will mean you'll have to change the way you do business, of course. But everyone's going to have to change the way they do business. As I say, trust me, as somebody who comes out of the media business, this is a, the, the, the world that I went into 25 years ago. It's completely transformed, completely transformed. Um, and yet, it remains vibra viable and vibrant. I want to close just with this thought that when you think about what it is that really changed the world as I described it, you know, from the world of the 1970s with the Soviet Union in intense geopolitical competition with the United States, with communism as a viable alternative around the world, with Western countries mired in, in depression, with civil wars taking place all over, to a world with which all its problems, we have had extraordinary levels of peace, stability, economic growth, globalization, and technological innovation. I would say at the heart of it actually has been the diffusion of knowledge. The diffusion of knowledge about politics, economics, uh, standards of living life. I give you a sense of this. When I, when I was visiting countries, when I was a kid, my father was a politician, I got a chance just to meet some government officials. What I was always struck by is that what you would find were two kinds of people in the third world, particularly. There were the really smart people who were in ministries and places like that, and they were all Marxists. Or you had the political hacks, and they were in it for themselves. And what has the, the sea change I have noticed is that if you go to finance ministries, central banks around the world now, what you will find is extraordinarily smart people, often trained at American universities, so look at Mexico as a perfect example. Look at the people who have run Mexico's economy over the last 15 years. And you will be able to find an almost one-to-one -one correlation with PhDs from the University of Chicago, Harvard, MIT. And, and what that is, is it, that has been a diffusion of knowledge of best practices that has taken place from the United States around the world. And it's taken place in politics, it's taken place in history, it's taken place most easy, easy to quantify and measure is, of course, economics. And you see everyone trying to measure up to these best practices. But there, there has been that process taking place in other elements of government. That has taken place in companies. That has taken place in nonprofits. I've been to museums now around the world which try to model themselves around some of the best practices that they have witnessed in the United States, which itself, of course, has been able to absorb some of the best practices. So that reality of the globalization of, of, of knowledge and so much of it emanating from the United States has been an extraordinary element of American power. You know, when, you look when we look back 100 years from now and people talk about how, how did America change the world, I don't think they're going to spend a lot of time talking about what we did in Afghanistan with 150,000 troops and a trillion dollars over 10 years. I think what they're going to talk a great deal about is the way in which graduates from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, the University of Chicago, Georgetown, all over, went to these countries and quietly and systematically changed the outlook of those countries so that they were thinking about the future, they were thinking about raising standards of living, they were asking themselves how they could manage the economy, and they were con conceiving of national power in a very different way than, say, Vladimir Putin does. They were conceiving of national power as not the acquisition of territory, but the inculcation of knowledge, the raising of standards of living, the, you know, the, the creation of a better quality of life. That is something that is at the heart of what America has exported to the world. And in that sense, you have all been part of this extraordinary diffusion of soft power that has taken place around the world. And if you do it right, you will continue to be innovate and to be at the cutting edges of that process. And the, the simplest way to, to, to get a sense of whether or not you are able to continue to do that will be whether 20 years from now, 30 years from now, you still have the ability in the United States to to, to send a signal of some kind or the other to that 15 or 16-year-old kid in India that I was in the 1960s and 70s and suggest and, 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 and uh, seduce that kid to believe that the most powerful way for him or her to expand themselves would be to come to the United States 
and to get the great, greatest education in the world. I still believe that if we do everything right, 30 years from now, the kid who looks like me growing up in a, in a, in a place like India will still look at the United States and say, that's the place that is inventing the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.